You know, it's interesting. We, we uh, so often get addicted to talking about all of the intricacies of big data and technology and how it's pushing viewers this way or that way. You know, and I'm often asked by the media, they call me up and they say, how, is, how are millennials being shaped by technology? And very often, I've, I've thought about this and I've gotten this question so many times that I often say, you know, you gotta step back and just reverse the arrow of causality here. Let's talk a little bit more about not how de technology is shaping generations, but how generations are shaping technology. So the generations which choose from the available technologies and they decide what's cool, and then everyone lands on it and tries to follow it, right? And if you really want to understand the future, if you really want to forecast how things are changing over time, rather than talk, study the technology, study the generational currents which are actually guiding people to choose this or that technology that they decide is cool. And typically that means choosing a certain kind of viewing experience and a certain kind of relationship with their content uh, that, that they want. Uh, whenever I talk to groups about uh, generations, uh, there's a, an initial reaction that this is uh, sort of intimidation. This is some huge abstract social science concept like generations. My god, how can I wrap my mind around it? Uh, the first thing I like to say is there's nothing abstract about it. It's very tangible, very personal. Um, take a look at this cartoon I'm going to show you right now. Three sets of high school sweethearts in three different decades. And uh, the point of this cartoon is to, is to bring home something I'm sure that's already occurred to all of you. And that is your generational location in life strongly shapes how you see life. It doesn't necessarily mean you had one of these conversations. I get a show of hands or something. But, um, <laughs> I'm sure you can appreciate how these images, something very important about the youth mood of the era. Uh, you go back in the 1950s, what was the highest priority for youth? Fitting in, meeting high social expectations, making long-term plans at a very early age, right? And to some extent, that kind of shaped how that generation navigated through their lives as they grew older. Look ahead 20 years, and suddenly the youth priorities had changed entirely. Now it was all about risk-taking, flouting convention, breaking rules, taking voyages to the interior. You had a completely different kind of youth priorities, right? And take, you know, go 20 years again into the future and you see suddenly now you have youth who um, are no longer, you know, live in a world which is newly dangerous, where the rules no longer protect young people. You have to look out for yourself, watch out for yourself. And that in turn has shaped another generation and how they see life. And the, and the more you look at this, you're going to wonder, you're going to ask questions like, how do the way these groups see life going to change the kinds of messages they respond to, uh, the candidates they vote for, the careers they choose? How are you going to sell products to them? And the relationship to the kind of content they're going to want on media and entertainment. Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to explore right now. Um, People often ask me, what is a generation? I'm talking about social generations here, not family generations. A generation is a group of people, and I'm kind of summing up about two centuries of sort of generations theory going back to the 19th century. But a social generation is a group of people born over about the length of a phase of life, about 20 years or so. Think of the time between being born and coming of age fully as an adult. So you expect generations to be of that length. And a generation, once you define them, shares three attributes. Um, a generation has attitudes and behaviors in common, which you can go out and measure. Uh, it has a certain self-identity. This is what Carl Mannheim said. It's, it's generation is not a, uh, an unconscious attribute. We, we're aware of it. We talk about it. My generation, your generation. People uh, have affinity to different generational names. It, uh, belonging to a generation, arguing about it, or just hating the whole idea is something that, that uh, that, that we do uh, deliberately. And finally, a generation has a certain location in history. That is to say, to belong to a generation means you shared certain experiences in childhood, a certain era of history, and you shared the experiences of a subsequent era coming of age into adulthood. And looking, we're going to talk a little bit about generations, because I want to give you a really good sense of good feel for, for how it works. These are some of the generations people often talk about. And here I give you some idea of their age location. So you, you look at these names, uh, the GI generation, the greatest generation, according to um, uh, you know, Tom Brokaw in his famous book. 
we all know who they are. Uh, they're defined by their age location in history, right? They came of age during World War II, the New Deal, the Great Depression, a uh, huge Promethean generation of builders and, and, and doers. Uh, I think all of us today are aware we sort of live in the civic shadow of that generation, which built so much, fought so many wars and so on, produced the cornucopia of prosperity that many of us who are their children and grandchildren enjoy. And then you look down and you see other generations who have been much uh, written about. The silent generation who actually got their name in a Time Magazine article in 1951. Uh, I think it was November 1951 in which they were called uh, the, the silent. This, these, these young men and women who seem to be almost middle-aged in their caution, uh, even in their early 20s. And, uh, they were, the, they were the children of the Great Depression and World War II. They were just too young to serve. And they came of age during the American High, the presidencies of Truman and Eisenhower and John Kennedy. Uh, boomers, by definition, have no memory of World War II. They were the children of the American High, and they came of age during that period of rapid social and cultural change we sometimes call the consciousness revolution. Boomers like to think they reshuffled the values, priorities in America. Um, you know, and that was sort of the ground zero of, of their sort of inner redefinition of, of what life meant. Uh, and then you look down, Generation X, they have no memory of the American high. Uh, they were the children of the consciousness revolution, the little kids of Woodstock. And they started coming of age in the early 80s when that period of social and family experimentation was essentially over. You know, the, the, the age of Reagan, and a lot of people wanted to suddenly, you know, I don't know, they wanted to join the military, get rich, go to business school, whatever it was. Very different era. Um, and it's very interesting, these, these years of the early 1960s, and I get into trouble with the Census Bureau and others, because I d define these generations. We've been writing about this uh, since the late 1980s, so for a long time. But we define these generations slightly differently. From a, from a social generational point of view, I have no doubt that the real dividing line between boomers and Xers is, is a bit earlier than the Census Bureau says. So we'll, we'll choose 1961. It's interesting, those early 1960s birth years, uh, in those years who are born, all of the iconic leaders of Generation X, you know, you think of Michael Jordan, uh, Michael Dell, Michael J. Fox, think of all the Michaels, uh, Quentin Tarantino, um, Jodie Foster, Doug Kuplin, who wrote the novel Generation X, giving the name to this generation, who was born in 1961, and who's the best known American born in 1961, anybody? Barack Obama, Barack Obama. there you go. Um, you think of Obama's life, right? Children of a broken family, childhood of complete disorientation, read his autobiography, he kind of puts together his life. He sort of self-constructs his life, kind of like the great Gatsby or something. He self-constructs this life. And, and very much an excerpt, not a boomer experience, a childhood of complete disorganization. Uh, and in his speeches, he always talks about himself as a post-boomer. He always has this stick about it. You know, there's a generation of Moses, we're the generation of Jericho. He has this big kind of Old Testament thing. But my point is, he's aware that he comes of age at a different time. And obviously, as many of you know, not just into rock and roll, but a little bit into hip hop. You know, he's a big Jay-Z fan. And I remember uh, many times he's gone before audiences, you know, filled with kids. And he'll, the first time I saw this was in 2008 when he got beaten by um, um, uh, Hillary in New Hampshire, he came down to North Carolina and he said, well, I, I got kind of beaten up there, I got to get the diss off me, and he did this kind of move, you know, like that. And uh, all, all the kids were screaming, and all these boomers are looking at him, what the hell are you doing, you know? What, what is that? But again, these are, these are generational differences, and we see that as we move through. And finally, you have millennials. Millennials have no memory of the consciousness revolution, so they, they don't even remember as children what that meant, and as you will see in a second, that has had huge impacts on how they, in turn, see life differently. And of course, they're coming of age at a very different time. One thing I want to do, I, I'm going to obviously talk about you know Gen Xers and Millennials, but I want to talk a little bit about these historical generations because I think we get so lost in the data and thinking about everything now, now, now that we lose sight of the rhythm. And I think it's important that you all realize how much generational change has always been there and how important it's been as we look back over people that we know. You know, this is uh, the living memory of America going back to the GIs. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about them, uh, this generation. Um, 
we talk so much about everything this generation built, right? But so rarely do we talk about who built them. Where did this generation come from? An extraordinary generation. Uh, and and the, the story begins in the early couple of decades, the early the first two decades of the 20th century, when, when these little kids were fussed over by parents and communities who wanted to raise up kids as good as the previous generation, who later became known as the lost generation, were just totally hopeless. You know, high rates of juvenile delinquency, crime, drug abuse, everything was horrible about these kids. It was written about all that. In fact, an important part of the whole progressive movement in America at that time was cleaning up the world of childhood. We had you know, protective playgrounds and prohibition to keep alcohol away from kids. We had the Harrison Drug Act to keep drugs away. I don't know if you're aware, but in 1900, Coca-Cola had the real thing. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, there was no protection at all for, for kids and drugs. And, and so we wanted to clean up the world of childhood. These were the first kids, for the first time in American history, everyone thought it'd be cool if kids wore uniforms. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H clubs, Campfire Girls, all that stuff. These were the first Miss Americas of the early 1920s. And they had this great sense of um, uh, optimism and common collective uh, 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 confidence about the future in the 20s. Come the Great Depression, they all voted hugely for the, for the, uh, the New Deal uh, and the, the political party that represented big government. Uh, they, you know, in 19... 1932 uh, and 36, uh, estimated 85% of this generation voted for, for, for the New Deal Party, uh, the first generation of African Americans to vote for the Democratic ticket, no longer the Republican ticket. These were the CCC dam builders and tree planters. These were the, these were the most uniform generation per capita in American history during World War II. And after the war, they just kept on building, right? They were programmed to you know, gather together and build the suburbs, the interstate highways, the miracle vaccines, later on as midlife leaders, model cities, the great society, trips to the moon. And as they did all these things, all these great civic achievements, they got into huge arguments with their boomer kids, born just after World War II, who didn't understand the moral purpose of just making institutions bigger and stronger and more collective all the time. So when this generation finally started retiring in the mid-1960s, um, they did something interesting. They, they liked to retire uh, to get away from the culture of their children. They started retiring in cities built in the middle of the desert, <laughs> like Leisure World and Sun City with age-restricted covenants so young people couldn't move anywhere near uh, so they could still listen to their Benny Goodman music. And as we remember, in their youth, everyone remembered them as these achieving kids. Everyone thought of them as junior citizens and when they started reaching age 65, and around 1965, we invented a new term to describe old people. We started calling them senior citizens, right? We never talked about old people as senior citizens before this generation uh, uh, started retiring. We just called them old people. You know, that, that, was, that was good enough. Um, uh, and as the lost generation, my god, in the 1950s, no one would have called them senior citizens. Um, so you think about a coming of age priority, rising community and progress, workplace reputation, the upbeat team player, the power elite, they came to Washington with the best and the brightest. Marketing themes, appeal to convention, community, big brands. And interestingly, and we're gonna have occasion to see this, actually there's a weird resonance a little bit with some of the themes I see among millennials today. And you're gonna come back to that. IT and media innovations, well it was just, you know, the, the pyramid, right? Someone at the top blasting messages down. This is the generation of propaganda. You know, someone at the top figured out the message and it kind of went out to everybody. Um, okay, next generation, the silent. Well, the silent came of age, again, grew up at a different time. The style of child rearing, which is becoming more protective for the GIs, approached the point of suffocation for these kids. Well, there, there was a war going on. I mean, there was a depression. Things were dangerous. Um, you think of them, uh, I, the iconic kids of this generation in the media, you think of the Little Rascals, Shirley Temple, good kids, tight envelope of protection. And when they started coming of age just after World War II, they surprised everyone. Every generation comes of age as a surprise. What was the surprise for them? Well, unlike the GI generation, they didn't join the Communist Party and want to change government top to bottom or conquer half the world or any of that. No, no, for this generation, their motto was, we don't want to change the system, we want to work within the system. 
Uh, Fortune Magazine had a cover story in 1949 called The College Class of 49, and the subtitle was Taking No Chances. They found that on their job interviews, their first questions were about pension plans. And in fact, they made all these decisions very early. This generation got married younger on average than any other generation in American history, partly because the economy was great and partly because they wanted to hedge all their bets really early. Uh, and they, um, and they, they got that 30-year invisible handshake with their employer, that defined benefit pension plan. Guess what? This generation is the only generation that's going to end up getting those defined benefit pension plans. It's all unraveling for us, right? But anyway, they, they, they had a clear idea of what you needed to, to succeed. They played by the rules, and the system has worked for them. This generation is now by far the most affluent relative to the young than any other generation of elders in American history. Uh, I work with, with actually the Fed in, the, in St. Louis. We have a big program looking at sort of generational, the economics of different generations. As of 2010, for the first time, age 75 plus had the highest median net worth of any age bracket. Remember, this generation came of age when the elderly were among the poorest Americans. Well, they have ridden success up with them. I'm sure you know Woody Allen here. One of his favorite expressions is, 80% of life is just showing up. <laughs> Think about it. I often ask Gen Xers about that joke, and they don't even find it funny. I mean, I don't get it. <laughs> what are you talking about? Just showing up? Uh, well, they, you know, they did it. You know, how to succeed in business without really trying. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Anyway, am amazing. Uh, you look at them now, coming of age priority, maximum community security. Remember all those weepy doo-bop songs back in the 50s and so on? Workplace reputation, the credentialed expert. They didn't invent the system, they inherited the system, and they made sure it worked perfectly. And by the way, in the workplace, they have a reputation as wonderfully nice, but you don't call them senior citizens. We don't have a name for this generation yet. <laughs> by the way, they don't want to be called senior citizens. You know that from AARP polls. Senior citizen, what does that mean? They didn't invent the A-bomb. They didn't splash ashore at Normandy. We need something more personal for them. Instead of senior citizen, how about, instead of senior citizen, how about senior partner? You know, old bopper, granddaddy-o, you know, something like that. But they find in the workplace they're highly prized because they're so nice. These were over-socialized kids when young, and they still are. They're wonderful in dealing with people. This may not be the greatest generation. They're the nicest generation. And you think about it, why, are they, why does CVS and Home Depot and all these companies want to hire them? Because they're so great with customers. And they do everything by the rules. They fill out all the forms in triplicate. They actually call in when they're sick. Um, who makes the greatest telemarketers today? They're so, they're so nice, you can't hang up on them, you know? <laughs> who does Walmart get to be their greeters? I mean, think about it, right? I mean, this is a persona that we're used to with this generation. It won't last with boomers when they, when they go in there. Marketing themes, credentials, niceness, sophistication. They want two sides to every story. You see, now people, ARP says, you market to our constituency. You need to give huge amounts of text. You know, it's kind of the opposite of their kids, Gen Xers, who all preferred sound bites. Uh, and key media IT innovations, and you can see some of the transformation. A lot of the increasing professionalization, incre increasing specialization of what the media meant. All right, let's move on. Boomers. Well, we all know about the boomer life story. It's, uh, the media's focused on it ever since they were born. Um, and you know, no phase of life means anything until boomers have experienced it and can tell other generations all about it, right? That's how it works. Uh, these were the feed on demand, Dr. Spock babies just after World War II. These were the indulged beaver cleavers of the 50s, the screaming radicals and inner city rioters and Vietnam grunts of the 60s, you know, the Forrest Gumps enjoying their runners high in the 70s. Finally, you remember in the early 80s, the famous yuppie, the sort of the upwardly mobile, you know, young professional with this very perfectionist and austere definition of what their career meant. It's much more oriented toward them than the institution they were working for. Um, and this leads to kind of the two biggest trends that, that at least I see when we think of, of boomers and who they are. Uh, one identified by Cheryl Mercer, the demographer, um, and it's, it's very simple. It's, the biggest trend that boomers represented in sort of changing ideas of how we ought to live our lives 
is their individualism, their sense of self-sufficiency. Boomers don't need anyone else. They don't need institutions, or at least they pretend not to. Uh, think about this. This is the first generation of women to basically think of themselves as economically and financially self-sufficient. I mean, that alone is historically, it's historical. I mean, uh, an amazing shift. Robert Putnam, the famous uh, sociologist at Harvard, wrote a book a number of years ago called Bowling Alone. And he asked the question, why Americans do things alone that we used to do in groups? Like bowling, we used to go with the Elks Club or something. You know, we went as a group. Now we just go alone, you know, bowling. Well, he looked, the book is this thick, you probably don't want to read it, so let me kind of sum it up quickly here for you. Um, he looked at every, all of the possible different variables in which things have changed, and, and he looked at it by cohort, and he finally came up with a conclusion that roughly two-thirds of the shift was simply generational replacement. Boomers and obviously extras following them were raised to do things alone and they were simply all the other generations were aging out. It's, it's not that individuals actually changed, it's that different generations were replacing older generations, and that's why we've become a much more individualist society. Um, the second master trend for boomers is their, their values orientation, right? Uh, this is a generation that's, that their moralism. This is a generation that's always thinking about you know, good versus bad, right versus wrong, true versus false. You think when they came of age at the time of, you know, consciousness three and the greening of America and the counterculture, right? And now that they're in, you know, positions of senior power and in late midlife, moving into retirement, it's no longer the counterculture, it's, it became culture wars, right? Red zone versus blue zone and, you know, um, uh, all of the ways in which they talk about the, the importance of lifestyles and principles, and you see it in the primaries, my God. I mean, you just look around and see what older people are so focused on when people are running for office, whether on the Democratic side or the Republican side now. And you can't compromise on values. That's what makes politics so vicious now. If it were economics, if it was just, you know, where are we gonna spend $10 billion, you could just split the difference, but you can't do that which makes this kind of generation so historically important because they are always generations, this kind of generation, which tends to congeal crisis as senior leaders. We saw it in, we saw it in the Civil War, we saw it in the American Revolution. I can give you other examples. This is a kind of generation that tends to drive younger generations crazy. Um, but I will say, you know, looking at this generation where it's going, um, coming of age priority, Rising individualism, the search for meaning. Um, uh, this has always been a, a huge deal for boomers, and now as they move into retirement, they're still searching you know, for meaningful retirement and how I'm gonna get a bigger picture on my life. Workplace reputation, the assertive visionary, the yuppie, the word cultural elite became very big in the 1990s, replacing the, the C. Wright Mills term, which became popular in the 1950s, the power elite, which was much more indicative of the GI uh, uh, perspective on life. Uh, this is, we do a lot of uh, surveying of workplace attitudes, and boomers, hands down, are by far the most workaholic. Uh, and they take pride in their, in, their, in, their work, in their work values, and they're constantly casting aspersions on younger people for their lack of them, right? So the boomer is the person who comes in on Monday morning and says, I worked 90 hours last week, just to make everyone feel bad. <laughs> and then all, there's always, though, there's some exer in the corner mumbling under their breath, but, but what did you get done in those 90 hours? <laughs> um, but anyway, this, this is something that, that younger generations feel. And again, it's part of that incredible values orientation that boomers have. Uh, the GI generation didn't have that attitude toward work. Believe me, when they got earlier retirement because they could save more and they had social security benefits, they retired as early as they could. <laughs> and their attitude was, you know, work was a thing. You did it, you got stuff done. And, but boomers had this cult, you know, from good to great, you know, the fifth discipline, you know, Zen and the art of whatever. It's like a Maharishi cult with them. Um, I have, I have exers come up to me and they say, what's the matter with good? You know, why great? Well, you know, we could actually go home, you know. Um, marketing themes, appeal to vision, values, experience, and the enormous rise of the experience economy. Remember, boomers are always looking for more than just the material. That was their GI thing building parents. They look for 
the immaterial. And, and this gave rise to you know, these wonderful books, like by, by Joe Pines called The Experience Economy. Uh, how to turn a 10 cent cup of coffee into a $6 experience. Well, that's the secret of Starbucks success. But you look around the entire economy now, everything with the highest margins in terms of your sales are experience things, things with an experience component. And I think, to a large extent, boomers are the ones that have taken us there. You know, you just think of the, you know, my God, all the images now of the experience economy that boomers have, have initiated. Uh, what were their media IT innovations? Well, a lot of it was increasing diversification, increasingly to subversive stuff, like alternative and new journalism, which is more about the person writing the article than about what you're interested in finding out about. Okay. Uh, how boomers have transform elderhood. As we move ahead and look at this generation, because they're moving into retirement, we're going to see, first of all, the end of traditional retirement. How is this generation is completely running the opposite direction than often their GI generation that they had as parents? Well, first of all, the GIs retired earlier. They are retiring later, right? You just can't get them away from work. Now, a lot of them were wiped out in the, in the great crash. Uh, but a lot of them just don't like the idea of retirement. So a lot of them are staying busy, particularly the more affluent end of this generation. We do, um, uh, another aspect that's very different is the, boom, the GIs wanted to get away from their kids. Boomers want to be near their kids, which is why they're not moving into these traditional senior communities. They want to stay around their kids. Their kids are increasingly living near them, living at home. Uh, the uh, huge uh, 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 return of the multi-generational family. And, and third is, is that uh, the GIs, although they didn't want to be with the kids, wanted to be together. Boomers want to be with the kids, but they don't want to be with each other. <laughs> you know, Give me like a chateau on a little rock somewhere where I can't have any neighbors, uh, but my kids can fly in, You know, something like that. Um, secondly, rising inequality and personal risk taking. Increasingly bifurcation in this generation between those who are well off and those who aren't off. Those who are retiring early on DI tend to be non-college. And those who are working later and more affluent tend to be a very different group. This is uh, extremely important to looking ahead, particularly those born late in the boomer years, like in the late 50s, and rise in personal risk taking. And I'm sure you've seen all the stories in the newspapers now about how in midlife, and particularly late midlife, and people in their late 50s and early 60s, you know, STDs are skyrocketing, alcoholism is skyrocketing, opioid use, you just go down the list, you know, suicides, accidents. All of this stuff, uh, even vehicular accidents are going up. Well, many of these things are actually going down among young people. So we see this kind of inversion of what we've noticed uh, in previous decades. And finally, rising cultural influence. Boomers have always defined themselves by their values and their ability to redefine the culture. And that will just stay as they grow older. You think of all the fads they invented as, as, as fringe movements. You know, everything from organic foods, you know, think of whole foods. To, to yoga and, and, and mindfulness and uh, complementary and alternative medicines. All these things are now mainstream. $30 billion industries, each one of them. And in the culture, they will remain dominant. If you reflected on, if you reflected on Super Bowl games, how many times boomers in the last 20 years have actually been the group invited to play? These guys are pushing 70. But you got you got the Stones and 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 Paul McCartney and the Who and Aerosmith and you know Sting and Madonna. You go down the list. They're still getting out there and they're still performing. And amazingly, millennials think they're great. <laughs> they're better than Xers. I mean, these guys are classic. I mean, after I listen to them, I want to go out and do a, a some summer camp and learn to do the perfect Led Zeppelin riffs or something. You know, because these are the class. Well, we see that again and again in, in history. Certain generations are associated with certain strengths. Millennial uh, boomers are associated with strengths in the culture. <coughs> and we see it as they grow older. You know, even in their 80s, uh, boomers will still be writing all the op-ed pieces in all the magazines. They'll still be screaming at each other on talk radio. It's not going to be a pretty picture. <laughs> and they're still going to be playing those 1,200 golden oldies until the last boomer dies. At which time Gen X will have a bonfire of celebration, you know, <laughs> liberated from this tyranny. So, all right. So let's say a few words now about Generation X. What about this generation? Um, well, you can see they made their debut in that Time magazine cover. That dates actually from the fall of 1990. And you see that picture? These are not 
brightly clad boomers on a hill teaching the world to sing. In fact, they look like in a maximum security prison cell. Um, they're all dressed in black. They're all looking in different directions, as though they have nothing to do with each other. And it, they don't seem particularly optimistic about their future. And this is one of the first things that you know about, about, uh, about I learned about Xers, is that Xers don't feel that they are a generation. They're just a bunch of bits and pieces and individuals and splinter groups. This is, first of all, the biggest immigrant generation per capita born in the 20th century. Uh, it's actually immigration is beginning to fall from millennials. So this could be a distinctive attribute of Xers as they grow older. They're also the most spread out in terms of income and wealth of any generation in America today. They have no middle class. So you, you know, it's not like the silent generation. You could follow the rules and actually get somewhere. No, you, it's, it's, like a, it's like a binary distribution. It's either win or lose. And you know most of you are going to lose, because that's everyone I've told you you're going to lose. So you don't want to be like people your own age. Uh, I, I went, um, when Bill Clinton first came to the White House, I live in the DC area, and I interviewed all of his, uh, the, the interns that came in with him. This was in 1993, and I interviewed them, and I said, tell me about your generation. I would go around, you know, tell me. And, and most of them would say things like, I don't belong to that generation. I came from a good family. I mean, that was their attitude. <laughs> It's like they belong to a giant traffic accident, you know? And so there they are. In, in our writing, we sometimes call them America's 13th generation. Uh, they are literally the 13th in a row since the first US generation of Sam Adams and Benjamin Franklin. We also sometimes call them a generation wearing shades. Anytime a boomer comes up to ask one of those probing, you know, personal philosophical questions, they can just put on those reflecting Ray-Ban sunglasses, right? That way, the, um, the exer gets to keep his privacy. The boomer can look at himself. That makes everyone happy, so you can see how that, you can see how that works. The number 13 also conjures up some of the bad luck and ill timing of their life cycle. Think about it. They came along in the early 1960s. Child rearing had already becoming more indulgent for boomers, and now it reached the point of complete underprotection. Um, divorce rate was beginning to accelerate. Schools no longer seemed to work. Uh, and people didn't want to have kids all of a sudden. I mean, these are the first, you know, kids that people took pills not to have, you know. Uh, and, and it was amazing how things changed. And even the fertility rate itself after 1962 began to plummet. This became known as a baby bus generation, the lowest fertility rate in American history in 1976, two years after Watergate. 1.6 children per woman per lifetime in that year. Um, so imagine, you know, that was their entry. And it's not just these trends that were getting worse. It was everything in the culture regarding kids that started worsening in a very unusual way. Um, have you ever thought about this? <laughs> have you ever thought about this? This is the most popular genre of movie for 20 years. And it exactly coincides with the early childhood of Generation X. Uh, they all had spin-outs and sequels because you could not help but make a profit off a movie with this kind of message. And when these kids weren't devouring older people, they were annoyances that were in the way. You remember Kramer versus Kramer? They were, um, um, they were kids so spoiled you wanted to shoot him. You remember the original Willy Wonka? Um, do you remember uh, Tatum O'Neill in Paper Moon? These were tough kids. These were hard kids. You didn't want to hug these kids. And, and there's a reason for that. Because at a time when older people were finding themselves, remember this after all was the late 60s and 70s, everyone was finding themselves. It was thought the best way to raise kids back then was to have kids raise themselves too. That solves everybody's problems. So you give them a latchkey guide, a self-care guide. Have them read Judy Bloom, the new realism. <laughs> They'll be happy to live in your house after they read that. But the point is that there's a point to this, and that people often ask me, how did Gen Xers get the way they are, and how do they see themselves? I can go into a classroom full of millennials who are like maybe freshmen in college, and I can talk about latchkey kids, and they will give me a glazed stare. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Every Xer that I talk to knows what a latchkey kid is. And that's how we derive different ways of looking at life. And we take those with us as we grow older. Uh, and these things, we began to see changes, actually, as this generation goes older. This is a famous uh, set, uh, survey. This is the UCLA freshman survey. They've been taking it since 1967. Two famous questions on this survey. 
you know, do you, do you, what's your big object in life? To be very well off financially or develop a meaningful philosophy of life? Well, look when boomers were college freshmen. It was like four to one, meaningful philosophy of life. Yeah, 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 the economy will always get us a good job, and you know, we want to explore. But look how that changed with Gen X, right? And this is the kind of the new realism, the new pragmatism, the new, um, and the, the whole ethic of free agency. It's up to you. It's up to your own. And you really got to focus on the bottom lines of life. And I think that's what everyone became aware of uh, in the early to mid 1980s when we saw a new generation emerging that became sort of everywhere during the 1990s. Um, so what do you say to this generation? Coming of age priority, maximum individualism, risk taking, workplace reputation, the get it done contractor with no safety nets. The free agent, you know, and maybe if you work for a large corporation, there'll be a, a matrix organization and a total rewards plan, and you, know, you can do whatever, you know, you can navigate your own career path. You know, you ask, you talk to millennials about it, and they say, no, no, tell me which way I'm going to go. Uh, so things are really changing there. Marketing themes. Um, well, this is, the, I don't know if you've seen the advanced auto parts ad, but it, it's, this is how they do speed training for someone delivering the muffler. They put slabs of meat on his waist, and they have lions coming after him. So that's how you train an exer. Marketing themes, appeal to efficiency, incentive, survivalism, and just a huge change in, in commercial marketing messages, which really became very uh, huge in the late 1990s, and we see everywhere now. A focus on getting rid of the middleman, bottom line, give me more convenience, give me cheaper price, don't sell me lifestyle, don't sell me anything that's, that's you know, extraneous. Again, focused on the bottom lines of life. And finally, the key IT and media innovations was basically taking all this new technology, and particularly I think they had an instrumental um, role in taking the web and making and applying it to commerce, uh, which you'd expect a generation like Xers to do. How they will transform midlife, economic stress, and the new frugality. We've written quite a bit about this. This generation was by far the most hammered by the crash in 2008, 2009. Every kind of data, I mean, I'm not going to bore you with all the details. They're far more likely, even today, to be underwater in their mortgages. They bought late into the stock market. They bought late into real estate. They really got hit the worst, and they still haven't recovered. Of all generations I worry about in the very slow economy today, it's Gen Xers, who are kind of running out of time, a lot of them. I don't worry so much about millennials. They've got a lot of time left, uh, but, but Xers I do. Um, sheltered kids, the close family. One of the great ironies, given how they were raised, is how intensely protective Xers are as parents, and how many of them are deliberately uh, not participating in the economy to spend more time at home, maybe in DIY activities, but always taking care of their parents. It's not just quality time, it's quantity time. Um, and finally, fall in social trust, rise in the whole ethic and personal empowerment. You see it constantly in branding now, particularly with things like personal price plans. I just noticed all the, you know, it's my Macy's, my fluid line, I am FedEx.com. I have no idea what that means, but you know, it sounds personally empowering, you know, and so if I'm an expert, I think, okay, I'm in charge. Prudentia, which used to have its motto called, you know, uh, strong as the rock of Gibraltar, you know, famously in the late 90s changed their slogan. They're, they're doing a lot of interviews with Xers and they had own a piece of the rock, right? Notice the change, right? Don't trust some big rock for everyone, but own a little piece yourself. All right, now we're going to talk about millennials. So we think millennials came on, uh, arrived in the early 1980s. Um, what happened when they arrived? Well, all of a sudden, all kinds of books and articles appeared how badly kids have been treated in the 70s. Maybe kids needed a new sense of mission, a new sense, you know, new protections, a new sense of structure. And many of the trends in, in American life, which were you know, part of that whole period of experimentation, social experimentation in the 70s, peaked right around 1981 and 82, and then have been declining ever since. I'm thinking about the abortion rate, the divorce rate, alcohol consumption per capita, which has been just gradually declining along with the rest, and many kinds of recreational drug, uh, drug use. So all of that was happening right at this time of kind of this climacteric, this kind of changing of the trend. And, and, and right about then, suddenly it was family values. Do you remember that? It was uh, suddenly everyone was into cocooning. All these boomers were having their kids, often having their, their, uh, their, their born again moment with the birth of their first child. Suddenly people rediscovering family. And right about that time, 
1982, there was a new bumper sticker on cars all across America. They'd be on board. You remember that? And it was a fixed, it was a it was affixed to a new kind of vehicle, the minivan, right? With 15 different ways of buckling that precious cargo into their seats. Back when Xers were kids, you just, you just told kids to do this, you know? <laughs> that was good enough. Um, all those movies, all those childhood devil horror movies suddenly bombed at the box office. No one would see them anymore. Instead, this cuddly baby movie was like Parenthood and Baby Boom and Three Men and a Baby. And remember all those horrible movies of John Travolta and all those talking babies? And <laughs> Well, another thing that changed was the child protection. All those gadgets you put on your stoves and your, and your, and your doors and, and the protective things on the playground and, and child helmets and all that became a multi-billion dollar industry in the 80s. It didn't exist in the 70s. You, I don't know, you did it with rubber band or cellophane. You, know, you did it on your own if you wanted to. Here's another interesting indicator of the change. In the late 70s, the percentage of fathers who were present at the birth of their child was 20%. By the late 80s, thanks to the Lamaze movement, 65%. By the way, today it's about 80%. It's another huge change. And as these kids started getting older, and, and they started entering kindergarten in the late 80s, like 89, 90, we suddenly declared school reform was the highest priority in America, right? We needed to just completely revamp how education was done. In fact, so many of the culture war issues that boomers like to talk about in the 90s and 00s revolved around how best to raise kids. People often ask me, why do millennials think they're so special? <laughs> it's because ever since I remember, everyone's been arguing about how to best to raise them. It's like that's the biggest issue in America today. Uh, that's how important they were. And as they started getting older, and you know, we started some of these culture war issues, they even entered, you know, as, as particularly in the 90s, people began to say, well, the, the biggest thing America needed was to raise a better generation of kids. And even in the media began to change. Instead of you know, treasured kids in the media, little kids, it was more about adolescence. You remember by the early 90s, it was, uh, it was uh, adolescence with soccer moms. And we saw movies like Sleepless in Seattle and, um, and Angels in the Outfield, right? These were kids who inspired their parents into becoming better people. We never saw that when Xers were growing up as kids. You know, we saw stuff like Brad, Bad News Bears, <laughs> just horrifying. Take a millennial, by the way, and have them watch Bad News Bears, and they'll just, they'll be like this. I can't believe you treated kids like this. Um, but anyway, so that's how things have changed. In fact, I often ask, because I often talk to people in the media, I said, what's the, what's the best plot line for a family comedy? And, the, and one of them answered, he says, well, you know, one thing that works really well is something like this. Um, millennial puts, X or dad into rehab. <laughs> Whoa, OK, you know, we'll try that one. Um, but you can see that. But as you see this generation evolve, you begin to see some big changes in behavior. This is something I want to point out, because people say, oh, you know, generations, it's just, you know, what are you really looking at? Or do you, just, do you have anything quantitative? Take a look at some of these I'm going to show you right now. And some of these are actually big good news trends. But the media often don't pay attention to them, because, you know, to them, if it bleeds, it leads. Take a look at this. This is the gold standard for measuring crime. It's called the youth, it's called the victimization survey. We've been doing it since 1973. It generally follows arrest records and you know, the, the other records we have, but it's by far the most accurate. This is youth crime. Of course, youth commit most crimes, so that's kind of indicative of the general trend. But take a look at this. Crime peaked in about 1983, 1994, just when you had the late wave Xers in that age bracket. And ever since, if millennials have been moving into that age bracket, look what's happened. That scale there goes all the way to zero. This is a 75% reduction in youth crime. This is probably the most dramatic decline in youth violence in all of American history. And we don't even notice it. We don't pay attention to it. Cities, you can walk around freely today, which you couldn't 25 years ago. These are, these are, these are amazing changes. Uh, it's not just crime. It's, it's risk-taking across the board. If any of you are interested in this, take a look at the CDC, Youth Risk Surveillance Indicators. Everything from you know, drinking while driving, or buckling your seatbelt, or sex in high school. I could go down a long list. They're almost all down. Um, substance use in the last 30 days. Uh, the two most dangerous substance abuse on a lifelong basis, tob uh, tobacco and alcohol are at the lowest rates ever today in grades 8, 10, and 12. And by the way, if I show this to a bunch of millennials, 
they find this chart amusing after they look at it for a while because they'll look at it for a while and then they'll, they'll say, oh, there's mom way up there. <laughs> um, uh, well, this is Duke's University's Index of Child Well-Being. They see the same thing. You know, I don't want to belabor this point. But anyway, these are some huge changes we've seen in, in, uh, in childhood, and particularly young adults, as they're moving into young adults. We predicted many of these things when we uh, wrote our first book on millennials. This is back in 1991, when we wrote Book Generations. And we thought, starting in the year 2000, people began to notice these changes, which no one was predicting in the year 1991, believe me. People talked about you know, super predators on American streets at that time. Uh, so what is the emer emer emerging peer personality? If you want, I've got a lot of books out there so you can read about it in more detail. I'm just kind of giving you an overview of how to look at generational differences. Well, the first thing about millennials, as you all know, is they're special, right? They're special in the eyes of the media. They're special in the eyes of politicians, of community leaders, and especially their parents. Parents are spending much more time with millennials than their own parents spent with them. We found that overwhelmingly true. Um, I just did a, a search recently on Ngram to look up the phrase, kids are special, how, long, how often it was mentioned in articles and books. Well, all you lecturers out there might notice that people born in the early 70s, no one ever used that expression, okay? It was just never uttered. <laughs> and, and you can see how, it's, how it suddenly rose up as millennials were kids. And, and this fixation, too, on specialness, you can see uh, the, the how, how millennials are crowding around the, these kids and what an amazing trend that's been. Teachers for the last 10 years, according to the MetLife you know, teacher survey, report that parents are their biggest professional problem, right? Always in their face. That's why they invented, you know, Edline and Blackboard to sort of divert these parents. You know, it's the only way you can deal with parents. And the same thing, same with the colleges. You know, they got the boomers and, and Xers now showing up for these freshman orientations. And it's huge event. It's like a two-day event, and they hand out teddy bears, and all the boomers are crying, you know? And then they make them sign covenants and contracts. Together, we're going to raise this very special child. You do these things, very important, very important, but please let us do these things, you know what I mean? It's kind of like jujitsu. You can't stop the pearl energy. You just kind of channel it, you know, like this. We've worked with almost every branch of the military, starting with the Marines in 2000. And they have completely revamped what they've done. I'm sure you know the, the US Army slogan, which I think gets it kind of right. You've raised them, you've raised them strong, we'll, we'll make them Army strong, right? So again, that whole idea of partnership is so important. And it's showing up in the workplace, right? Bring your parent to work week. <laughs> I mean, I, I, people used to laugh when I talked about this a few years ago. Yahoo, LinkedIn, all these companies are now adopting it. Um, and what they found was, as a manager, you go talk to a millennials, as soon as you leave the room, they're on the cell phone with their parent anyway. So you might as well just bring them into the loop, you know. <laughs> um, OK, sheltered. Ever since they came along, they've been sheltered. We have all these, just think of all the laws. We've only had about two or three periods in American history of kind of moral panics over children and, and child protection frenzies. We've just lived through 20 years of one of these periods. Think of all the laws named after millennial victims like Megan laws or Adam alerts and all that. Um, and, and for the younger age of this generation, it's, it's over the top, right? So, um, but millennials expect to be sheltered. Why? Because they're special. I mean, it makes sense to them. Whereas Xers would say, you know, why are you trying to protect me? And I don't trust you and all that. Well, they, don't, they get it. Uh, positive. We see increasingly as a generation is very positive in their views for the future. This is, again, a little bit of a distinction from Generation X, being collectively positive about how they'll come out. Um, team playing. Again, the old ethic of doing things as a community. We've seen that both at the level of community service, and of course, we see it at a much broader level of just their affinity for social media. It's millennials who chose social media. It's not social media was invented and then forced on millennials, OK? I guarantee you that that's the direction of causality. I don't think anyone was talking about social media before millennials arrived and began to practice it. Um, and finally, conventional. You ask millennials what they want to do as they grow older. They say, I want to be a good parent. I want to be a good neighbor. I want to be a good citizen. Uh, you know, I want to start a family, raise kids. And I want to spend time with my parents. My god. Um, that was different than my generation. We find a record large share of teens today report no problems with any family member, much higher than it was for Xers or boomers. And that is leading to what I pointed out earlier, a huge renaissance in multi-generational family living. 
tens of millions of young people living with their parents that used to live alone. I think that's one of the most stunning shifts and, and unrecognized shifts that's going on today. And finally, just to look quickly at some of the new trends we expect coming along, is increasingly a risk-averse generation of young adults, less likely to get driver's licenses and not really care about car brands that are advertising independence and risk-taking. Millennials have no interest in that. Um, and increasingly risk averse in the marketplace. You know, they don't want to own stocks. They don't want to own real estate. Uh, they're not starting new businesses anymore. Uh, they're winning credit cards. They're doing juice crawls instead of bar crawls. I, I, don't, know, I, don't, know what to, I don't know where to stop here, but, but this is a new generation. Um, rising social trust, ties to the community. That's something we're going to see. We see it in the sharing economy, and we see it uh, in new attitudes toward work, in which you work together in a big, big space, big office, you know, where you're all working together physically. You know, leave those little end offices where you can be alone to the boomers. They really don't want to see anybody anyway. Um, <laughs> and then this is the generation that's voting and, and advocating for the party of big government, the party that believes in the community, for better or for worse. That's where they are, by, by huge margins, margins we really haven't seen in the last 30 years. Uh, this is a generation that represents the new nice. <laughs> We've done a number of articles on this. You just look at the popularity of Jimmy Fallon, right? Not insulting his guests, not doing anything that's nasty, wanting to be always playful, never being downbeat. Uh, or look at, uh, look at uh, on The Daily Show, uh, 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 Noah Trevor. Um, Trevor Noah, thank you. I didn't know what Trevor. Um, Trevor Noah. But this is the new kind of thing that's, that's, that has tremendous appeal. And you see it in the decline of brands like Abercrombie and Fitch. You see it, look at, the, look at the employer brands that work with this generation. They just love bomb them, you know? When I was age 20, I would have avoided anyone that was targeting me with stuff like this. I would say, oh my god, you know? Uh, no, please. Uh, but they love this stuff. Yeah, you trust me, you really want to really work with us. Achievement orientation. Wherever millennials do, we did a question at MTV um, was about two years ago. We asked, uh, true or false, life is really like a video game. 60% of people under age 30 said true. And when we followed up and asked them why, they said, well, this life is like that. It's basically uh, 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 problem, Rules, achievement, reward. Problem, rules, achievement, reward. Right? That's what life was. Whether you're studying for your AP exam or studying for your next you know, career milestone, that's what you did. And we see it increasingly in the kinds of products which have all these achievement-oriented metrics, whether it's betterment or mint or all the things they love to do. And you see the increasing uh, robo-investors now do this. We have all these, it's like playing The Sims. You, know? you just dial up that happiness quotient a little bit. Um, a rising focus on structure and planning. You see overwhelmingly in the workplace what they want is guidance, supervision, they want mentoring, they want, you know, this would make them such a, um, um, uh, a difficult generation, a, a, a costly generation in terms of time and effort to onboard because they demand these things. Uh, and you also look at their orientation toward long-term planning. The idea of long-term planning is important to me. They're equally as likely to say that as older generations and much more likely than older generations say they were when they were in their 20s, um, you know, in terms of savings and things like that. Well, where is this going? Um, coming of age priority, rediscovering community and optimism, workplace reputation, net centric team player, uh, organization kids actually was a term uh, uh, coined by David Brooks. Appeal to friends, family, funds, social causes, and of course their uh, IT media innovations you, know, you are all familiar with. What does this mean? Let me just sum up quickly. Generations, we believe, actually have a rhythm, have a cycle in American history. And they're actually synced to some of the larger rhythms of history itself. Some generations, like hero generations, are protectively nurtured. They come of age during a time of national need, a time of growing crisis and historical urgency. And later on, they become a generation of team players and builders. Other generations, like profit archetypes, are born after the crisis is over, they're indulgently raised, and they inspire and lead all of the great awakenings of American history. And if you see American history as a sequence, roughly about 40 years between huge national crises and cultural and religious and spiritual awakenings, you can see how this both gives rise to, both causes and is caused by a sequential 
process of generational change, which we think is a wonderful way of looking into the future and forecasting what's to come. Um, so when you look at this generation, we might wonder, will they reshape America in the 21st century as much as the GI generation did in the 20th? Well, I don't know. But I will say the decade we're in now, to, just to my eye, looks a lot like the 30s. <laughs> we're worried about you know, stagnating global economy. We're worried about deflation. We're worried about trade wars. Uh, we're worried about uh, uh, lawless autocracies in parts of the world with no longer any global leadership. We're worried about declining fertility rates. We're worried about many of the things that people worried about in the 30s. And mainly the responses we see, such as more people living together, such as actually a blanding of the culture and less risk, personal risk taking, are some of the things we actually saw in the late 1930s, both here and, and in much of the Western world, as well as in East Asia. And we think that there's something here. We think this is the rhythm we should pay attention to. And um, because looking at generations and looking at it, each generation is always entering a new age bracket is a wonderful way of forecasting what's to come. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>